Assalamualaikum everyone and a very good day to all. In this video, we shall learn about the schemes and techniques that we will use to change an analog signal to a digital signal, which is also called as analog digital conversion technique. And we will also learn about the transmission mode. Um, the analog digital conversion includes the uh, pulse code modulation and also delta modulation. And the um, transmission modes include the serial transmission as well as a parallel transmission. Here is the table of contents for you to navigate through this video. In the previous videos, we saw uh, digital data converted into digital signals. However, sometimes we have analog signal, the one created by microphone or film camera. Um, so we, we want to convert it into a digital signal. As uh, we can see in previous chapter, digital signal is superior to an analog signal. So uh, the tendency nowadays it is to change an analog signal to digital data. Uh, and in this section, we describe two techniques, which is pulse code modulation or PCM and delta modulation. And these two uh, modulation is to convert uh, analog to digital. After we have the digital data, then we can create or digitize it uh, using the previous uh, using the techniques that described in this chapter, but previous videos uh, to convert from digital data to digital signal. Pulse code modulation or PCM is basically the most common technique to change an analog signal to digital data, which is also known as digitization. And uh, so um, in PCM, we have encoder and decoder. At the encoder, we have three processes, which is sampling, quantization, and then encoding. So the first step is uh, sampling. So let's look at some of the terms used in sampling. Um, we have uh, the analog signal is sampled every TS seconds, where TS is the sample interval or period. So the inverse of period is the frequency. So uh, the inverse of the sampling interval is called the sampling rate or sampling frequency and denoted by Fs, where Fs equals to 1 over Ts. And um, we should also remember that according to Nyquist theorem, the sampling rate must be at least twice the highest frequency contained in the signal. So as you can see in this figure, uh, we have the... Um, components of PCM encoder. So the analog signal is sampled and then the sampled signal is quantized and the quantized values are then encoded as streams of bits. All right, um, so this will become a digital data, which later on we can encode it into a digital signal. So uh, you will see later how it would um, happen in the decoder. So this is uh, an animation to summarize the pulse code modulation at the encoder components where we have analog data and we sample it through pulse amplitude modulation. The um, sample analog data, we quantize it and from there we can have a binary encoding and this binary data can be encoded using line coding and we will have the digital signal.
So let's have a look at the first step in uh, pulse code modulation, which is sampling. So um, there are three sampling methods, and they are known as ideal, natural, and flat top. In ideal sampling, classes from the analog signal are sampled. This is a, an ideal sampling method, and it cannot be easily implemented. And um, let's go to the next sampling method, which is the natural sampling. Um, what basically what happened is that we have a switch uh, with a high speed switch which is turned on for a very small period of time and uh, that's when the sampling occur so the result of the uh, the result of the sampling is a sequence of samples and this sample retain the shape of the analog signal okay um, that is natural sampling and then the third uh, type of sampling method is the most common sampling method which is uh, called uh, sample and hole or flat top sampling okay so um, this is as you can see that we sample and we hold and this creates the flat top okay and um, the sampling process uh, is also sometimes referred to as uh, Pulse amplitude modulation, okay, or PAM, and but you have to remember that the result is still an analog signal, but uh, the the value is a non-integral values, okay. In order for you to do a sampling, then you need to consider one of the important uh, parameters, which is the sampling rate or frequency. So if you remember from Nyquist theorem, in order to reproduce the original analog signal, it is necessary uh, to have the sampling rate be at least twice the highest frequency in the original signal. So what does it mean by that is that uh, firstly, as you can see in this figure, we have two types of signals. Uh, we have a low pass signal and a band pass signal and both signal is band limited okay so uh, this kind of signal can be sampled however if you have a signal with an infinite bandwidth then we cannot sample uh, that kind of signal so uh, we can only sample a signal only if the signal is band limited okay secondly uh, the sampling rate must be at least twice or two times the highest frequency, not the bandwidth, or the, not to confuse you, in the analog signal uh, low pass, low pass analog signal, the bandwidth and the highest frequency are the same value because the minimum frequency is zero, so you will get the bandwidth equals to the highest frequency. But if it is a, a band pass analog signal, then the bandwidth will be lower than the value of the maximum signal. So here you can, sh uh, you can see the value of the sampling rate for the two types of signals. Let's see an example on sampling. In this case, we want to sample a simple sine wave at three different scenarios, three different sampling rates. Okay, let's see the first one. We have uh, Fs equals to 2F, which is the Nyquist rate. And then we have um, F, a sampling rate equals to 4F, which is two times the Nyquist rate. And then another sampling rate is equals to um, one half the Nyquist rate, which is just F. So in this figure, you can see the sampling and the subsequent recovery of the signal on the right. So uh, after sampling happened, okay. So as you can see here, uh, the sampling at the Nyquist rate can create a good approximation of the original sine wave uh, if you use um, 2F, okay. Uh, sampling rate Fs equals to 2F. Okay, so this is a good approximation, right, of the uh, original sine wave. And then um, we have a scenario of uh, sampling rate equals to 4F. This is actually oversampling, but it creates the same as approximation as, um, as you can see in part A, which is Fs equals to 2F. But it is actually redundant and unnecessary because you need to sample more points, more, into, uh, more values of the uh, analog signal uh, but you get the exact same uh, result as when you use only uh, fs equals to 2f ok 
Okay, so let's see the third scenario when you have fs equals to f, which is one half the Nyquist rate. And you can see the sampling below the Nyquist rate actually does not produce a signal that looks like the original sine wave. So this is uh, under sampling. So as you can see, we have um, the ideal situation when you use uh, 2f, which is the Nyquist rate. And then you also have, you can see uh, what will happen when you have oversampling and uh, also under sampling. Let's see another example on sampling where we have an interesting one. We want to sample a periodic event such as the revolution of a hand of a clock. So as you uh, already know, the second hand of a clock has a period of 60 seconds. And uh, according to the Nyquist theorem, we need to sample the hand every 30 seconds because uh, sampling frequency is inverse proportional to sampling interval. So f s equals to 2f, it, it means that the sampling interval equals to half of t okay so half of pre uh, that means that 60 second divided by 2 you get 30 seconds so in the first example we are sampling at Nyquist rate uh, we can see that sample points in order are 12 6 12 6 and then 12 again and then from here you, the receiver of the samples cannot tell if the clock is moving forward or backward um, and then if we go to B, this is over sampling where we sample at double the Nyquist rate, which is every 15 seconds. Uh, the redundancy uh, actually shows, uh, gives this, the, the uh, samples um, more information. So we know that whether the clock is moving forward. Okay, so in the over sampling, uh, which is above the Nyquist rate, uh, Ts equals to T1 over 4. You can see that the sample points are actually 12, 3, 6, 9, and 12. And then good. Uh, yeah, you can see it is moving forward, right? And in the case of undersampling, we can see that um, with um, uh, it is below the Nyquist rate. Okay. So Ts equals to 3 over 4t or Fs equals to 4 over 3f. Okay, so in this particular case, the sample points are 12, 9, 6, 3, and 12. Okay, so uh, actually the, the clock is moving forward, but the receiver would think that the clock is moving backward. So this is the scenarios uh, of different scenarios when you uh, use different type of uh, necklace rate. Okay, we have something, over something, as well as under something. Another example that relates to um, example to just now is that when we have um, four moving car in a, in a movie, but sometimes we can see it moving backward, like a backward rotation of the wheels. Uh, this is because of the undersampling. So a movie is filmed typically at 24 frames per second, but if the wheel is rotating more than 12 times per second, then the undersampling creates the impression of a backward rotation. And another example of the sampling is um, in a telephone companies, uh, they typically digitize voice by assuming a maximum frequency of 4,000 Hz. So the sampling rate therefore is at 8,000 samples per second. Okay, let's see another example involving a low pass signal. Uh, the bandwidth given is 200 kHz. So uh, in the low pass signal, remember what I told you just now, the bandwidth is equal to the maximum frequency. So uh, the question is, the um, why is the minimum sampling rate for the signal? So again, the bandwidth of a low pass signal is between 0 and F. F is the maximum frequency and also equal to the bandwidth. So um, therefore, we can sample this signal at two times the highest frequency, which is 200 kilohertz. And the sampling rate is therefore 400 kilo or 400,000 samples per second. Last example on uh, a complex band pass signal. Again, it has a bandwidth of 200 kilohertz. And uh, the question is, what is the minimum sampling rate for this signal? Um, we cannot find this minimum sampling rate in this case because we do not know um, where the bandwidth starts or ends. So we don't know the maximum frequency in the signal. So if you are only given the bandwidth uh, of a band pass signal, you need an additional information, either the, the um, initial frequency or the maximum frequency but if you have the 
maximum frequency, then from there you can calculate the minimum sampling rate right away. So let's go to the second process in pulse code modulation, which is the sample signal is quantized. So we need to do quantization. So the result of a sampling is a series of pulses with amplitude values between the maximum and minimum amplitudes of the signal. So we have a set of amplitudes which uh, can be infinite with non-integral values between the two limits, okay? um, the maximum and minimum amplitudes. And these values cannot be used in the encoding process. Um, therefore, we need to do the following steps in quantization. Okay, so first we assume that the original uh, analog signal has instantaneous amplitudes between uh, Vmin and Vmax. Okay, and then we divide the range into L zones, uh, each of a height delta, and from there, we assign quantized values of 0 to L minus 1 to the midpoint of each zone. And then we um, approximate the value of the sample amplitude to the quantized values. You can also calculate uh, the quantization error uh, to the SNRDB of the signal. Okay, uh, There is a contribution to the SNRDB of the signal. Depends on the number of quantization levels, L. Or the bits per sample NB. Okay, so uh, SNRDB equals to 6.02 NB plus 1.76. Okay. okay, so this is an example of a quantization. Um, it is given a sample signal and sample amplitudes are between minus 20 and plus 20 volt. So from there, you know that um, the first step is to assume the original analog signal has instantaneous amplitudes between V min and V max, and V min here is minus 20 and V max is plus 20 volt. Then we need to divide the range into L zones. Um, so in this particular case, we decided uh, to actually divide it into A. Okay, so this is a simple example. So we assume that sample signal and sample amplitudes are between minus 20 and plus 20, and we decide to have eight levels. Okay, L equals to 8. So from there, we can actually calculate uh, the delta or the height of each zone or each level where we have V max minus V min divided by L and uh, substitute all the information and you get delta equals to 5 volts. So each of the zone has um, a height of 5 volts. Okay, so in this second example, 7.5 amplitude, uh, it is in the second zone, okay, as it is greater than 5 volt but lesser than 10 volt. Okay, um, here we have nine samples using ideal sampling. This is for simplicity. So from here, uh, of each sample, we can see the value of the actual amplitude. So from these values, we can calculate uh, different information, like for example, normalized value. Uh, normalized PAM value, PAM stands for uh, pulse amplitude modulation. And um, how can we do this? It is by uh, dividing the actual amplitude with delta. So uh, let's say 7.5 divided by 5, so you get 1.5. Okay, so this is the normalized value. From the normalized value, we want to quantize it. So uh, we find the uh, quantization value from the middle of each zone. Okay, so this is the quantization process. This means that the normalized quantized value are different from the normalized amplitudes. Okay, um, let's see the example of minus 6.1. Okay, so the normalized quantized value would be somewhere in the, in the middle of the second uh, zone in the, at the bottom. So it will be minus 1.5. Okay, um, so as you can see again, the, the normalized quantized value and the normalized amplitude are different. And the difference is what we call the normalized error. So that's how we, ca uh, we calculate the normalized error. We um, minus normalized quantized value with normalized PAM values. Okay, like for example, um, here we have... Um, 3.50 minus 3.24 and you shall get the normalized error is 0 0.26. Okay, so from each of these um, 
component uh, or amplitude or the signal, then you would know what is the quantization code okay, based on the zone itself. Okay, so like for example, here you have you start with zero. Okay, uh, you can see that the zero level is in the middle part of uh, zone, the bottom, the most bottom part of uh, this whole uh, graph. So if you start from there, then you get to where minus 6.1, 6 it is in the quantization code of 2. Okay, and then 7.5 would be at quantization of 5. 16.2 at quantization of 7, if you go along with the zone, each zone. Okay, so the, the quantization code will be between 0 to 7, or 0 to uh, L minus 1. Okay, so and each of the quantization code has its own encoded words in binary. So for 2 is 0, 1, 0, 4, 5 is 1, 0, 1, 7 is 1, 1, 1, and so on. So each of the sampling is being quantized and each of the quantized has been encoded. Okay, so um, this is, uh, as you can see here again, I'll just go back to the fourth row that is the quantization code. And for each sample, it is based on the quantization level at the left of the graph, and the encoded word are the final products of the conversion. Okay, so so um, basically, in this particular example, we have eight quantization levels. So in terms of quantization levels, um, the the choice how we choose the L is uh, the number of the levels. It depends on the range of the amplitudes of the analog signal and how accurately we need to recover the signal. So for example, if the amplitude of a signal fluctuates between two values only, then we need only two levels. If the signal like voice, like our voice, it has many amplitude values, so we need more quantization levels. In audio digitizing, L is normally chosen to be 256. But in video, it is normally thousands of levels. Okay, so choosing lower level, lower value of L increases the quantization error if there is a lot of fluctuation within the signal itself. So uh, another factor that we need to know about quantization is the quantization error, because uh, quantization process is basically an approximation process, and um, so the input values to the quantizer are the real values, but the output values are the approximated values. So the output values are chosen to be the middle value in the zone. If the output value is also at the middle of the zone, then there is no quantization error. Otherwise, there, there will be an error as uh, we've seen in the previous um, example. So um, the quantization error basically changes the signal to noise ratio of the signal which in turn reduce the upper limit capacity according to Shannon. It can be proven uh, that the contribution of the quantization error to the SNRDB of the signal depends on the num number of quantization levels L or the bits per sample and B as shown in the formula here. SNRDB equals to 6.02 NB plus 1.76 db so what is the snrdb um like for example in this particular uh example um we should know that bit rate equals to uh since we have three number of bits per sample so nb equals to three so 6.02 times three plus 1.76 okay so uh the snrdb in this particular example is 19 point to db so as we increase the number of level it increases the snr let's see another example a telephone uh, subscriber line must have snr db above 40 okay that is the requirement so uh, what would be the minimum number of bits per sample so from the equation that we have on the um, quantization error just now we can in, uh, inverse calculate it and we get n equals to 6.35 uh, that is the minimum so we need to make it into an actual number a whole number so it is either 7 or 8 bits for samples another example we want to digitize the human voice what is the bit rate assuming we have 8 bits per sample 
So the human voice normally have uh, frequencies between 0 to 4000 Hz. So the sampling rate and the beat rate can be calculated. And sampling rate goes to 4000 times 2, normal Nyquist rate. So that means that 8000 samples per second. Whereas the beat rate, it based on the number of bits per sample. So you have uh, just now 8000 samples per second and each sample has 8 bits. So multiply that together, you get 64,000 bits per second or 64k bit per second. So in order to uh, recover the original signal, uh, we require the process of pulse code modulation decoder. So the decoder first use circuitry to convert the code words into a pulse that holds the amplitude until the next pulse. So after uh, the staircase signal is completed, it is passed through a low pass filter to smooth the staircase signal into an analog signal. The filter has the same cutoff frequency as the original signal at the sender if the signal has been sampled at or greater than the Nyquist sample rate and if there are enough quantization levels, the original signal will be recreated. Uh, remember that the maximum and minimum values of the original signal can be achieved by using amplification. Okay, um, in this figure, it shows the whole simplified process. Suppose that we are given the bandwidth of a low pass analog signal, then we need to digitize and then the new minimum bandwidth of the channel um, that can pass this digitized signal will be greater. Um, the new bandwidth will be n times um, nb times greater than the bandwidth of the analog signal because this is the price that we pay for digitization. So in this particular case, we have um, the bandwidth of the analog signal is 4 kilohertz and we need a channel with a minimum bandwidth of 4 kilohertz. So if we digitize and we send 8 bits per sample, then the, the new minimum bandwidth is 32 kilohertz, where 8 times 4 kilohertz. Pulse code modulation is actually a very complex technique. There are other techniques that have been developed to reduce the complexity of uh, PCM, and the simplest is delta modulation or DM. So in PCM, it finds the value of the signal amplitude for each sample, whereas in delta modulation, it finds the change between uh, from the previous sample. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this is an example of data modulation and there are no code words here. There are all bits uh, and they are sent uh, one after another. And um, this is at the, at the modulator, okay, at the modula modulation part. Um, it is used to, at the sender side to create a stream of bits from an analog signal. So the process needs to record the small positive or negative changes and this is called delta that's why we call it delta modulation so if the delta is positive the process records a, a one and if it is uh, negative then process records as zero however the process needs a base against which uh, the announcement can be compared to so that's why the monitor create a second signal that resembles this uh, staircase signal so finding the change is then reduced to comparing this input signal with the gradually made staircase signal. As you can see in this figure, uh, the modulator at each sampling interval, it compares the value of the analog signal with the last value of the staircase signal. Okay, um, And then, if uh, the amplitude of the analog signal is larger, then the next bit in the digital data will be 1. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, in the first one, it is larger than the um, staircase, then it will become 1. And then the next one also larger than 1, 1, 1, 1, until it becomes uh, the analog signal is lower than the um, in the staircase, then it will be 0. So if uh, the next bit is 1, the staircase maker moves to the last point of the staircase, signal delta up. If the next bit is 0, it moves it, um, the delta down. Okay, so uh, we also need a delay unit to actually hold the staircase function for a period between the two comparison. So in this um, figure, you can see the modulator and demodulator, uh, where 
modulator is when we modulate uh, on to the modulation of uh, data modulation and then we need to demodulate again to find the um, uh, where at the demodulator, demodulator it takes the digital data using the staircase maker again and the delay unit and uh, it will create the analog signal again. So the, the created analog signal however needs to pass through a low pass filter for smoothing. So this is the, the diagram of the whole process. One of the things that we need to consider when we do data transmission is to know uh, the uh, wiring between one device to another because um, we are concerned about the data stream. Okay, so do we need to send one bit at a time or do we need to group bits into larger groups and if so how do we do that? The transmission of binary data across a link can be accomplished in either parallel or serial mode and in parallel mode multiple uh, multiple bits are sent with each clock tick and in serial mode one bit is sent with each clock tick while there is one way to send parallel data there are three subclasses for serial transmission and they are asynchronous synchronous and isochronous let's go to the first uh, type of transmission parallel transmission so when we talk about um, data, especially binary data, it consists of ones and zeros, and they can be organized into different groups and encoding like uh, of a group of n bits each. Okay, just like when we are talking, instead of uh, speaking in letters, we are using the form of words. So similar analogy by grouping, we can send data n bits at a time instead of one. So this is what we call parallel transmission. The mechanism for parallel transmission is a simple one. We use n number of wires to send n number of bits at one time. That way, each bit has its own wire and all n bits of one group can be transmitted with each clock tick from one device to another. So in this particular example, we have n equals to 8. We have uh, 8 bits sent together, so we need 8 lines or 8 wires and they are bundled in a cable with a connector at each end. So the advantages of um, parallel transmission is speed. Okay, uh, with all else being equal, parallel transmission can increase the transfer speed by a factor of n over serial transmission. But there is a significant disadvantage, which is cost, um, because parallel transmission requires n number of communication lines or wires in this particular example, just to transmit the data stream. Because of this uh, expensive, uh, the costly, Pedal transmission is usually limited for short distances uh, transmission only. So let's see this animation where we can see the parallel transmission uh, mechanism where uh, it requires n communication lines just to transmit the data streams and the data streams here we have 8 bits and they are sent simultaneously. In serial transmission, one bit follows another, so we need one communication channel rather than N to transmit data within two communicating devices. As you can see here in this uh, figure, we have eight bits sent one after another, so we need only one line or wire. And uh, if we have uh, a bit stream of a parallel, um, we need to convert it first into a serial converter. Okay, and then again, when you receive, you need to convert from serial to parallel again. So the advantage of serial communication or transmission is um, um, with only one communication channel, serial transmission reduce the cost of transmission uh, over a parallel by roughly a factor of n. And since communication within devices is parallel, conversion devices are required at the interface between the sender and the line where I mentioned just now we need to do a parallel to serial conversion and between the line and the receiver uh, that is the serial to parallel okay so serial transmission occurs in one of three ways asynchronous synchronous and isochronous okay asynchronous transmission is um, actually we named it so because that the timing of a signal is not uh, taken into account okay um, instead information is received and translated by uh, certain patterns as long as those patterns are followed, then the receiving device can retrieve the information without regard to the uh, rhythm or the timing in which it is sent. Uh, patterns are based on grouping the bit stream into bytes. Each group, usually 8 bits, is sent along the link as a unit. 
The sending system handles each group independently relaying to the link whenever ready without regard to a timer. So without synchronization, the receiver cannot use timing to predict when the next group will arrive. So to alert the receiver to the arrival of a new group, therefore an extra bit is added to the beginning of each byte and this bit is, is usually a zero, it is called the start bit. To let the receiver know that the bit is finished, one or more additional bits are appended or added at the end of the byte and these bits usually one and are called stop bits. By this method, each byte is increased in size to at least 10 bits in which 8 bits is information and 2 bits or more are signals to the receiver. In addition, the transmission of uh, each byte may then be followed by a gap of varying duration and this gap can be represented either by an idle channel or by a stream of additional stop bits. Okay. So, um, the start and stop bits as well as the gap alert to the receiver to the beginning and end of the each byte and allow it to synchronize with the data stream. This mechanism is called asynchronous because at the byte level, the sender and receiver do not have to be synchronized. But within each byte, the receiver still uh, must be synchronized with the incoming bit stream. Uh, that is why some synchronization is still required but only for the duration of a single byte. The receiving device resynchronizes at the onset of each new byte. When the receiver detects a start bit, it sets a timer and begins counting bits as they come in. After n bits, the receiver looks for a stop bit. As soon as it detects a stop bit, it waits until it detects the, na the next uh, start bit. So that is why asynchronous here means asynchronous at the byte level, but the bits are still synchronized and the duration are the same. Okay, um, so in this figure, we can see the schematic illustration of asynchronous transmission where we have the start bits 0 and the stop bits are 1 and the gap is represented by um, into the bit stream, making it asynchronous transmission. Okay, uh, it is slower than the form of transmission that can operate without the addition of control information, uh, like the start and stop bits, but it is cheap and effective and two advantages that make it attractive choice for situations such as low speed communication. For example, uh, the connection of a keyboard to a computer is a natural application for asynchronous transmission where a user types only one character at a time, types streaming slowly in data processing terms, and leaves unpredictable gaps in between the um, in between characters. In synchronous transmission, the bit stream is combined and make it into a longer frames, which con uh, may contain multiple bytes. And each byte, however, is introduced onto the transmission without a gap between it and the next one. It is left to the receiver to separate the bit stream into bytes for decoding purposes. In other words, the data are transmitted as an unbroken string of ones and zeros and the receiver separates that string into the bytes or characters it needs to reconstruct the information. Right, um, in this um, illustration, in this figure uh, of synchronous transmission, we have drawn in the division between bytes, but in reality, there are no division. Those divisions do not exist. Uh, the sender puts its data onto the line as one long string and the send, if the sender wishes to send data in separate bursts, the gaps between bursts must be filled with the special sequences of zeros and ones that means idle. And the receiver will count the bits as they arrive and groups them in 8-bit units. Without gaps and start and stop bits, there is no built-in mechanism to help the receiving device to adjust its bit synchronization midstream. So timing is very important um, because um, the accuracy of the received information is completely dependent on the ability of the receiving device to keep an accurate count of the bits as they come in. So the, uh, the advantages of a synchronous transmission is speed because we don't, we don't have these extra bits or gaps um, where we need to introduce at the sending end uh, or the receiver end and remove at the receiving end okay and by extension with fewer bits to move across the link so synchronous transmission is faster than asynchronous transmission for this reason also it is more useful for high speed applications such as the transmission from one computer to another 
pipe synchronization is uh, accomplished in the data link layer. And another point here is that there is no gap between characters in synchronous serial transmission. Um, but there may be uneven gaps between, frame, uh, between frames. The last type of uh, transmission mode is the isochronous uh, transmission. And uh, this is typically can be found in uh, real-time audio and video in which uneven delays between frames are not acceptable. So um, in synchronous transmission, uh, if there's this uneven delays, that means that the synchronous transmission fails. For example, in TV images that are broadcast at rate of 30 image per second, they must be viewed at the same rate. If each image is sent by using one or more frames, there should be no delays between the frames. For this type of application, synchronization between characters is not enough. The entire stream of bits must be synchronized. So this is um, what we call the isochronous, where in the isochronous transmission, it guarantees that the data arrive at a fixed rate. And that is uh, all on transmission mode. Before I end this video, please let me know how is your understanding on this topic throughout this video so far at this link. Your participation is highly appreciated. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you and see you on the next video.